All right, Dr. Gott, all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flynn, and thank you so much for inviting me and for having these educational programs. They're so important. Um, so uh, I look forward today to talking to you about liver disease. It's one of my passions, and I hope that you'll see why the liver is such an exciting and important organ through this time. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about causes of liver disease and treatments for liver disease. And the first thing I wanted to review is just the outline for the talk, some questions that I thought people may have in the audience that we would like to go over. What are the most common causes of liver disease? How is liver disease diagnosed? How can I determine how severe my liver disease is? If I have liver disease, what are my treatment options? And then how can I heal my mind, heart, and body? And we'll come back to that a little bit. But, again, that's one of the reasons why we have the Community Resource Center is because we have a lot of um, other resources that we should all be aware of. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about medicine today, but there's definitely an intersection of this when we're thinking about our health. This uh, talk is really directed toward patients. I know that there are a lot of providers on the line. I saw some names uh, on the participant list. And so just try to think of yourself in the, in the mind of a patient throughout this as well. So what does the liver do? Um, I think the liver is the most fascinating organ, obviously, since it's my career choice. But the liver is part of the GI tract, and very basically the liver has a right and a left side. It ha it's attached to the gallbladder. There's a bile duct that connects down from the liver to the small intestine. Uh, the pancreas hides right behind that, and then you can see the intestines sort of wind their way through the abdomen. The liver has many forms uh, and functions, and I like to tell people when I'm talking to them about their liver that the liver is like a tree in the summer, and all the leaves of the tree are the liver cells, and all the branches and the trunk of the tree are the bile ducts. Uh, and this was um, a sort of a vision that my mentor, Dr. Marian Peters at UCSF, uh, provided me with. So this is her idea, but I love it, and I think it really rings true to people when they're trying to visualize. And I think that the liver is actually a very visual organ. Um, and the things that the liver does is it detoxifies the blood. So anytime we take in a medication or an herb, uh, the liver is actually breaking down that substance. Uh, it also synthesizes. It has lots of properties that it's synthesizing, bile, protein, clotting factors for helping us um, so that we don't bleed, cholesterol, carbohydrate. It also stores things like a glucose and vitamins and then can actually um, convert glucose um, through to an energy source for our body. Uh, and it protects against infection. It's actually part of the immune system as well. So this is just three big buckets of what the liver does, but there are many different types of functions of the liver. It's extremely important. And I also described to my patients that the liver is like the quarterback of the body. Uh, and so if the liver isn't working, many of the other organs in the body also won't know what to do. They won't be able to um, coordinate their function. So how does liver disease develop? Well, the first thing is that there's an insult to the liver, and I put a little asterisk there because there are a lot of different types of insults to the liver, and so we're calling it liver disease, and we'll kind of get back to that as we move through these slides. But there's some type of insult to the liver, and sometimes, but not always, that will cause inflammation of the liver, and then inflammation can go on to cause injury, and if the injury is severe, then people actually ultimately get scarring, and the ultimate form of scarring, and there are stages of scarring, is cirrhosis. Uh, and then some people who have cirrhosis can go on to have difficulties with things like ascites, bleeding, confusion, cancer, jaundice, muscle loss, and infection. And if these are terms um, that you don't know about and you wonder about what they are, you can write them down and we can kind of get back to them in the Q&A and really flush this out. But I wasn't clear in terms of all the different people who are on the line what, what you might be interested in, and this is really about helping you. So uh, write down questions if you have them throughout this. But again, not everyone who has an insult to the liver goes through this, these stages of disease, and we're going to talk about that. When I'm talking to my patients, I describe the liver, uh, a healthy liver, as a peach. It's nice and flesh-like uh, and soft. But what can happen over time if there's recurrent inflammation and injury resulting in scarring, that ultimately if people have prolonged star scarring that it's fully throughout the liver, then the liver can turn into a hard um, 
sort of a hard organ, and I say that it, it turns into what feels like a cauliflower or a broccoli, and actually it kind of looks like that. I, I saw that there are some uh, transplant uh, team members on the line, um, including some physician's assistants who, who know what that, this looks like in the operating room, and indeed um, the, cer- the cirrhotic liver is a shrunken liver, whereas a healthy liver is like a soft, fleshy peach. So again, I think it's important for people to hear on the line that if you have liver disease, you are not, it's not a guarantee that you're going to have problems with scarring. Um, and so we can talk about how we make that assessment in another few slides. The key, therefore, with all liver disease is prevention. Uh, if we prevent liver disease from beginning uh, in the first place, then we're already like way ahead of the game. And then for many of the liver diseases, we can treat them to control the inflammation and injury that is occurring. So moving back to our questions, uh, that was really just a baseline to understand what the liver is and how can it show us if there's disease and injury. And now we're going to move to the first question we may have, which is what are the most common causes of liver disease? So this is an old slide from over a decade ago, but the same data is true now, and that is that hepatitis C in this country is the most common cause of liver disease at present, uh, and historically speaking, for for the past many decades. About 42% of liver disease at present is due to hepatitis C, though this is decreasing because I'm going to tell you about how we can now cure hepatitis C, which is hugely exciting. There was a combination of hepatitis C and alcohol disease uh, that was quite prominent. Uh, Again, now that we're curing hepatitis C, this is less common. Alcohol-related liver disease is therefore the second most common cause of liver disease in this country. Uh, And then the third leading cause is non-alcoholic liver disease. Another um, name for this is fatty liver disease. So we're going to spend some time talking about hepatitis C, alcohol-related liver disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The other types are different genetic causes, um, but I wanted to also spend a moment talking about hepatitis B. And though it is a small proportion of overall liver disease in the United States, it is actually a larger proportion of what we see here in the Bay Area, and I'm going to review that uh, in a little bit. So this is for patients who are on the wait list for liver transplant with some more recent data um, through to 2013. And I put this here just to show that the... the, the um, causes for being on the liver transplant list are the same as the underlying causes of liver disease in the population, uh, with hepatitis C here being the most common, then alcohol-related liver disease. I hope you can see my pointer in these little dots. But the reason I also put this up is because I wanted to show you the important increase in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is NASH, you can see that that is increasing. And in fact, it's on its trajectory to overcome hepatitis C as the most common cause of liver transplant and liver disease in this country. So hepatitis C uh, is um, a disease that was in highest prevalence, as you can see here, uh, more into the 70s and 80s when people contracted the disease. And then it takes on the order of decades, 20, 30 years, before people will become symptomatic if they're going to be symptomatic. And that's this idea of something called a birth cohort. So Patients who were born, or rather people who were born in the 1950s and 60s, uh, they came into their you know, 20s and 30s here, into the um, 70s and 80s. And this is before we identified what hepatitis C was. And so people were inadvertently getting infected and they didn't know it. Um, so now what it happens is the CDC actually recommends that all people over the age of 18 get a one-time screen for hepatitis C antibody. This is an update to their guidelines that were put out uh, in around April of this year. But the, the highest prevalence is in patients who were born in 1950s and 60s. And so it used to be that people, it was recommended that patients born between 1945 and 65 were the first cohort that we recommended screening. And now we have a newer screening protocol where we're recommending anyone over the age of 18. And that's shown here. Uh, These are the CDC website recommendations. I accessed this today. Um, And you can see that there's universal screen that is recommended for one-time screening for people over 18 and then women who are pregnant. 
And then there's also people who are considered to possibly be of higher risk due to recognized risk factors or exposures, including people with HIV, people who use injection drug uh, needles, people who have elevation of the ALT number. We're going to talk about that. Uh, Hemodialysis patients. And then patients who are having transfusions or organ transplants or other blood components before 1992. as that was when we started to understand how to start screening um, the blood supply, even though we had not yet identified hepatitis C. Healthcare workers who have, may have had an exposure are an important person uh, pe- group to screen, and then children born to hepatitis C infected mothers. I will say that the likelihood of transmitting through vertical transmission, which is when a positive patient for hepatitis C has a baby, is less than 5%, so it's very unusual. Hepatitis C, uh, I failed to mention, is something called an RNA virus, uh, and so that is something where it is transmitted either most commonly through blood, but also through semen, uh, and so that's how people got it in the past, was either through blood transfusion or a procedure with a contaminated needle or a contaminated needle through intravenous drug use, um, but again, now we are able to screen our blood supply, um, and so that is not an ongoing concern for uh, contraction of hepatitis C but that we often are identifying and diagnosing patients who, again, got the hepatitis C decades ago. So moving along to alcohol-related liver disease. So alcohol-related liver disease, as I mentioned, is the second most common underlying liver disease in this country. And alcohol-related liver disease is indeed a spectrum of disease, anything from a little bit of inflammation to inflammation plus scarring. There's also a condition called alcoholic hepatitis, which I like to describe as the toxic effects of alcohol, where you get a big surge of inflammation in the liver. And then finally, alcoholic cirrhosis. There have been studies um, where you look at the U.S. population and you can quantify um, alcohol use, and about 6% of men and 4% of women have some form of alcohol-related liver disease as a result of their alcohol use. Importantly, the healthcare costs related to alcohol are really high, $250 billion in 2010. And in 2010, 250,000 people died uh, annually um, from a diagnosis related to hepatitis, I mean, alcohol liver disease. Uh, we've passed now over 250,000 deaths in the United States in the last nine months um, from COVID-19, just to kind of give you a sense of the of sort of the... the the spectrum of what we're seeing with COVID-19. There is high risk drinking, and this has increased by 30% over the past decade. Uh, and also the risk of increased drinking is, is increasing in specific uh, groups, including young people as well as in women. So like I mentioned, alcohol-related liver disease is also a spectrum. Um, you can have chronic alcohol consumption and have a healthy liver, And then from there, you could go on to develop fatty liver from alcohol, and that's really what the pathogenesis, meaning the cause of liver disease, is in alcohol. Alcohol is ingested, and then as it's metabolized in the liver, because we talked that liver is detoxifying and metabolizing uh, substances that we bring into our body, uh, it actually goes on to metabolize and cause fat in the liver, and it's actually fat in the liver that causes inflammation and scarring. So alcoholic steatohepatitis is another name for saying that there's fat, steato, and hepatitis inflammation. And that, when it's to the most severe acute point, like that idea of the toxic effect I was talking about, people can get alcoholic hepatitis. Alternatively, people can also go on a different pathway where they're getting alcohol-related cirrhosis, which is scarring of the whole liver over time. And again, this oftentimes, from an alcoholic cirrhosis perspective, is taking decades. All patients who have cirrhosis are at risk for developing liver cancer, uh, and so a small percentage of patients who have cirrhosis can go on to get alcohol-related liver cancer. There's a lot of questions that I get from patients as to, like, why why does one person drink one amount, another person drink another amount, but they may have different manifestations of their uh, 
liver when it comes to alcohol, and that's because there are a lot of different modifying factors as listed here. Um, There's a lot of discussion around the importance and synergy of having obesity and non-alcohol-related liver disease, which I'm about to talk about, as well as alcohol-related disease. There's genetics at play that we don't clearly understand them fully at this point. Uh, Men are able to metabolize alcohol more effectively than women, as we'll talk about. Nutritional status is very important. Um, Oftentimes, when people begin drinking very seriously and heavily, they can um, stop eating, and then we can have even more severe manifestations of things, for example, like alcoholic hepatitis. Um, And I'll leave it at that, but again, there are many different factors that we're paying attention to when we're looking at helping people with alcohol-related liver disease. So what is the standard drink? Um, This is from the CDC website, and these are U.S. standard drink sizes. Interestingly, different countries have different standard drink sizes, but uh, we in the United States consider um, a standard drink uh, one unit to be 10 grams. Uh, And so there's 12 ounces of beer would be a standard drink, 8 ounces of malt liquor, five ounces of wine, which would be a 12% alcohol content, and then 1.5 ounces of a um, distilled spirit or liquor, which would be 80 proof. So that's things like gin or rum or vodka or whiskey. Uh, I've had patients say to me, well, doc, I don't drink. I just drink beer. I gave up the hard stuff. Um, And I just remind them that Again, all of these products have alcohol in them, and it's just a matter of what the concentration is and and what the idea of a serving size is. So moderate and binge drinking definition. So moderate drinking, as defined by the CDC and the 2015 to 2020 U.S. Dietary Guidelines for Americans, is one drink for women, women and up to two drinks for men per day. Uh, and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how maybe having a glass of red wine a day is good for your heart, but that actually has now come into a bit of controversy. Um, but, but moderate drinking really should be no more than a drink a day for a woman and two drinks a day for men and not every day. Binge drinking, as the corollary, is a pattern of drinking that brings a person's blood alcohol concentration to 0.08 grams per deciliter or above. Men drink five drinks in two hours is considered to be able to increase this uh, to the blood alcohol level, and that's what's considered binge drinking for a man and four drinks in two hours for a woman. Heavy alcohol use is defined as binge drinking five or more days per month. And the amount of binge drinking uh, that's been um, occurring in the past decade has gone up very significantly, Uh, and again, particularly in certain um, uh, groups. So switching gears from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease to alcohol, I mean, sorry, from alcohol-related liver disease to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, this occurs in approximately 24% of the U.S. population. And the risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease include obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. And this is something called the metabolic syndrome. And what all of these things are indicating is that an individual is having difficulty responding well to insulin. So the pathogenesis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or the mechanism by which it develops is actually insulin resistance where the body is not responding well to insulin. It's trying to metabolize fat carbohydrates, triglycerides, and then it's being deposited into the liver as fat. Importantly, it's reversible with weight loss, which I'm going to talk about soon. And again, like alcohol-related liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there's a spectrum. And so not all patients with fat in their liver will have inflammation and scarring. And that's outlined here. Um, I've put the sources of my graphics. Many of these graphics are not my own. I found them on the web, and I wanted to make sure that uh, the resources are appropriately um, credited. Um, So this is, and there are many different graphics that show this important progression. So you have a healthy liver here where there is no fat in the liver, and we define no fat in the liver as less than 5%. But what can happen is with people who have uh, fatty liver disease is they can move on to start to have fat in their liver. And it's over 5% where they make that threshold, and then we grade that as mild, moderate, and severe. Um, 
this, by the way, can be reversed by losing weight and getting the fat out of the liver. It can go back to normal. Similarly, there's a percentage of patients, and again, healthy liver to fat in the liver, 30%, 15 to 30% of the time. So not, not everyone. In fact, only the minority of people with um, fat in their liver will go on to have problems, which is shown here, where 10 to 40% of people who have fat in their liver will go on to develop what's called steatosis, which we kind of talk, steatohepatitis, which is where the fat actually causes inflammation, and that's outlined here. And then over time, if you have the type of fat that has inflammation, those are the kind of people who can go on to develop cirrhosis over time. But again, through all of these points, you can see that it's not everyone. It's a minority of patients that have fat in their liver that will go on to have problems. The difficulty is it's hard sometimes for us to predict who those people are going to be. We have different scores that we can use. And then we have other markers um, that I'm going to talk about that we can kind of help get a sense of. Do you have fat that's not causing a problem or do you have fat that is or could potentially cause a problem in the future? And then again, you see this word hepatocellular carcinoma coming up. That's liver cancer. Because this patient has cirrhosis, they're at risk for this developing. The reason why the United States has such a high prevalence of fatty liver disease is because we have a very high prevalence of obesity, and this is data out through um, that was just released 2019, looking at the United States and coloring each state by their um, prevalence of obesity. Uh, The dark darkest red maroon states have over 35% of patients, of people in their population uh, obese, uh, then followed by the orange and then the yellow. And only one um, state in the country, Colorado, had less than 20% of adults with obesity. Uh, uh, The Washington, D.C. also um, same. So this is really important because Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is something that we can work toward improving, uh, but we're going to talk about why the obesity epidemic is part of the problem. So this is what a fatty liver looks like. None of these white dots and collections should be in the liver. It should all be these nice pink little liver cells. So this is a very fatty liver, and it can come either from alcohol or from uh, insulin resistance, uh, and, which, you know, is when we can't process carbo- carbohydrates effectively. And both of them show a liver that looks like this with fat in the liver and potentially inflammation and scarring. Uh, because as I mentioned, when you metabolize alcohol, it gets broken down into fat. And when you metabolize carbohydrates, um, it gets broken down into fats as well. This website, I think, is a really interesting website. It's called Sugar Science at UCSF.edu, and it has all kinds of information around sugar, around how we think about um, diet, the, the problems that can occur, not just from the liver, but other things that occur can occur when we have too much sugar and carbohydrate in our diet. So if you're interested in looking into that more, this is a great uh, resource. And for people who may be clinicians on the line, they also have printable resources where if you wanted to have something in your clinic about sugary sodas and the problems that occur there, uh, or if you're interested in policy and how to try to sort of change how we think about our diet more on a public health level, uh, that's a good resource for you. So, Moving gears to hepatitis B, just to summarize, we talked about the three most common causes of liver disease, hepatitis C, alcohol-related liver disease, and non-alcohol fatty liver disease, but I did want to take a moment to talk about hepatitis B. So hepatitis B is a worldwide problem, and you can see where the darkest blue is, um, parts of Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, some parts in South America. These have the highest rates what we call endemic, meaning just baseline uh, infections in their uh, populations, and we describe that as over 8%. Uh, And then you can see in the United States, our endemic baseline uh, rate is less than 2%. But again, because in the Bay Area, we have many people who have been immigrated from lots of different places throughout the world, uh, including... Uh, Asia, we have a higher prevalence here in the Bay Area as compared to elsewhere in the United States. Um, about 1 to 2.2 million Americans do have um, hepatitis B, and I reviewed uh, where they, the, oftentimes what populations are most affected. Hepatitis B, in contrast to hepatitis C, 
is a DNA virus, so bo- though they're both called viral hepatitis. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus, and hepatitis B is a DNA virus. They're both transmitted in the same way, which is through blood and semen. And a common exposure for people is if they didn't know that their mother had hepatitis B at the time of birth, and then the baby got exposed. This is the absolute uh, likelihood of getting this is actually low, less than 10%. However, um, that is one of the mechanisms for people to get chronic infection. Uh, and it's very interesting, and that would be like a whole other talk uh, in and of itself about hepatitis B in the natural history. Um, but so that's why, for example, we're going to review who should get screened for hepatitis B and talk about um, some of those groups. Uh, it is preventable by vaccination, and we've had the vaccination um, in large-scale uh, vaccine programs since uh, the 90s. Uh, so these are the groups that should be screened for hepatitis B, um, and I won't go over all of them, but I'm going to pause so you can look through the slides yourself and just remind yourself. Obviously, those people who may have been born in those dark blue um, countries with the high endemicity, um, those, are pa- those are people who should be screened. Firstborn generation uh, to those parents, i.e. this question of perhaps could they have gotten vertical transmission through birth. Uh, people who are using IV drugs, men who have sex with men, people who are receiving immunosuppressive therapy because we can un- sort of unmask hepatitis B. Uh, so lots of important things to be thinking about with screening for hepatitis B. So moving along to how can I determine how severe my liver disease is. So liver disease is diagnosed through clinical history, physical exam, lab tests, liver biopsy, and radiology studies. And so we're going to break these down a bit. And I'll, I'll move through this rather quickly in the sense that we were we have, you know, I don't want to be taking too much time so that everyone can ask questions. But again, if there are questions that come up from these that I haven't covered, we could ask them in the Q&A. So clinical history, obviously, is fundamental to everything we do in medicine. If we are not actively listening to the people who are most important to us, the patients in front of us, we are missing out on a lot. Um, So when I'm taking a clinical history, I'm trying to understand what's bothering the patient, what are their symptoms, um, do they feel fatigue, do they have nausea, vomiting, do they have abdominal pain, have they noticed yelling of their eyes? These might be suggestions that something is going on with the liver, but importantly, Many patients have no symptoms of liver disease when they ultimately are diagnosed. So that's something we're looking for, but even if they don't have symptoms, it doesn't mean they don't have liver disease. We're looking at potential exposures. Did they take a medication that could be causing irritation? Um, Did they have um, an exposure to hepatitis B, hepatitis A, if they might know about that? Family history is important for the genetic cause of the liver disease that I didn't talk about, um, and we can review later in the Q&A if people have specific questions. And then a social history. How much are people drinking? Are they using intravenous drugs? Is there something else that's going on? And on physical exam, patients who have early liver disease oftentimes will have no findings on physical exam, but in people who have late uh, uh, findings, it usually means they have advanced disease, yellowing of the eyes or skin, an enlarged liver or a hardened liver. They can have red palms and muscle wasting. They can have swelling of their abdomen or their belly and their legs. And they can have these abnormal blood vessels, and I showed a picture of it. It's called a spider angiomata. And if you press the center of this, the whole thing will blanch, meaning it will go white, and then it will fill in again. So lab tests are an important thing that we check as liver doctors because they can give us a lot of clues. Number one, they help us to diagnose liver disease because, again, there has to be an irritant that causes inflammation, and the inflammation is what we can see in lab tests when we're looking at liver enzymes, things called the AST and ALT, um, bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase. And so if these are abnormal, it gives us a hint that someone has liver disease, and then we have to go figure out the cause. There are things called liver function tests, which show us how the liver is functioning. So some people who have irritation, they just have irritation, inflammation, but their liver is functioning fine. Other people, that inflammation and irritation has gone on to cause problems with the liver's function. And we can get a hint of that from things like bilirubin, INR, albumin, platelet count. And then 
Once we've diagnosed that there's something going on with the liver, something that's not right, it's irritated and inflamed, then we can do things what are called serologies, which help us to work up what might be the cause. For example, viral hepatitis, like we've talked about. We talked about the two most common, but there are many others. Autoimmune liver diseases, which we haven't spoken about. Genetic diseases. So there's like a little ma- uh, menu of tests that we can check in the blood to see if we're getting a clue as to what might be causing the problem. For the clinicians in the group as well, you know that the pattern of liver enzyme abnormality really helps us also to narrow how we might actually be um, thinking about um, the causes. Liver biopsy is not always required, but it can be extremely helpful in providing a diagnosis by looking at the pattern of liver injury, but also it helps us by giving us a degree of scarring. Is this someone who has, for example non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and they have fat but no scarring, or are they on this spectrum where they've gone on to have fat and inflammation, i.e. steatohepatitis, and ultimately scarring. Um, So liver biopsy can indeed be helpful, but it's not always required. Radiology studies can also give us an idea if someone has liver disease, and then if so, what might be uh, part of the problem. Um, It often, though, is normal in people who have liver disease. And so, again, this is just one of the tools in our toolbox, but it doesn't, if, if it's normal, it doesn't mean someone doesn't have a potential problem. Um, we use uh, ultrasound, which is what this is, and CT scan, which is this, and something called MRI and other things to, to look for uh, potential problems. Uh, these Tests can show us fat in the liver. They can show us blood vessel abnormalities, which may be a cause for liver disease or liver trouble. They can call, show us liver lesions, which is what these little arrows are helpfully pointing out. Uh, and they can show us scarring. For example, in the CT scan, you can imagine if you look at the edge of this liver, see how it's kind of bumpy here and bumpy there and then bumpy here. I'm hoping that you're seeing a cauliflower in your mind's eye. Um, as I described, and so that's sort of how we might get a sense of, oh, someone has cirrhosis. Uh, This could be a way of looking at that. And then here, just to say, I had put out that there are some manifestations of cirrhosis, including ascites, and that's what this fluid here around the liver is, is that's what ascites looks like. So how can I tell if I have scarring? Well, first, you can look at um, whether or not... um, There has been scarring by a liver biopsy, as we mentioned, but that requires a procedure and, and, you know, there's always concern for when we have to use a needle if there's going to be a potential complication. The other thing we can use is something called FibroScan or elastography, and over the past many years, FibroScan really has replaced in many uh, patients the need for liver biopsy. And what a FibroScan is is a special kind of ultrasound where you put a probe on the side where the liver is and you send sound waves back and forth through the liver. And um, you can see how fast the sound waves travel, and that's related to resistance, which is ultimately related to scarring. So, um, sorry, I just see, looking at the chat a little bit. Um, So that's how we could figure out perhaps if someone has scarring is if there's higher resistance, that's a higher likelihood of having scarring. We can put a, a score to that. It also allows us to get a sense of how much fat someone has in the liver. So we find this to be very helpful, and we have FibroScan here at CPMC. So moving now to, let's say there is scarring of the liver. How do we quantify how severe it may be? And I, here it's saying how healthy is the liver. And the other way of saying it is, oh, my liver is scarred. How sick could it be? Um, and there are toolboxes for this as well, something called the child pew class and the MELD score. So I describe this to my patients uh, as the following. So if you have cirrhosis, then we can quantify how severe the liver is Um, damages by saying you either have an A, B, or C grade. And an A liver is a cirrhotic liver that is still able to do its job. We want to keep people's livers there once we find out they have cirrhosis. We're doing everything we can to prevent ongoing destruction or damage or progression. Someone who has moved into the child's class B category, there the liver is showing signs that it's working too hard. This is where patients will start to have problems with swelling of the belly or ankles, i.e. this thing called ascites. You could have 
yellowing of their eyes. They could have the malnutrition we're talking about. They could have problems with something called hepatic encephalopathy where they start to have trouble cleaning their blood and therefore toxins like ammonia can build up and cause confusion. Um, so that's what child's class B is. So when you move from an A to a B, that actually becomes a bit of a problem because if we can't stabilize it, people can start to get symptomatic from their liver disease. Finally, a child's C-class liver, I described to my patients, is a liver that's like, I can't take it anymore. I'm too stressed out. It's too much is going on, and I just can't keep it together. Um, and so those, those livers, oftentimes, these are the patients where we're working really hard to see if we can uh, get them on the liver transplant list um, or do something to help with the, the main symptoms. The MELD score is another way of categorizing how sick the liver is, and in fact, it's uh, a way to determine the likelihood of death that's three months. And it's based on looking at a, uh, some of the blood um, tests that we check, which m- mirror what is going on with the liver in terms of its function. This is the INR, the creatinine, the bilirubin, and the sodium. Historically, we've called it the MELD score. It was developed as the MELD score, with this, um, but uh, we now have added sodium into it, so it's the MELD NA score. Uh, but what we see is that a normal liver, meaning a cirrhotic liver, I should say, not a normal liver. A normal liver would have a low score as well, but we're really using this to apply to cirrhotic livers at this point, i.e., my liver is sick, how bad is it? Um, so a nor- the lowest MELD score you can get is the MELD score of six. These are the people with the child's class A cirrhotic, like my liver is scarred, but it's working. So these are those patients, their risk of mortality from their liver uh, is very, very low. But as the liver starts to show signs that it's working hard to do its jobs and then it can't take it anymore, you can see that the mortality, the risk of death, goes up to about 100% if your MELD score is over 40 by three months. Uh, So we're really working, again, on people who are here in this area to think about can we do a liver transplant. Uh, And when they're down here, we're thinking how do we keep them here? How do we prevent them from having worsening disease over time? The way that liver transplants work in this country is that it's the sickest patients first, meaning the people with the highest MELD score at the top of the list, and then people whose MELD scores are lower are lower on the list. So now we've talked about what common causes there are, how do we diagnose it, how do we determine the severity, um, and what if I have liver disease, what are my treatment options? So I've listed here the most common causes of liver disease and their treatments. So hepatitis C, really important. Um, In fact, so important that the three scientists who really discovered hepatitis C won the Nobel Prize um, in science this year. And uh, now we have medications based on the foundation of science that they were able to put forth for the scientific community. We have medications that can cure hepatitis C over 95% of the time, and there are these regimens of pills that are well-tolerated, uh, and it's truly remarkable. Uh, over um, 10 years ago, it was really unfortunate how hard we had to work to only cure you know, 10 50% of the patients we are curing, and now within the past five years, we've really changed how that looks, and people are getting cured from hepatitis C. Alcohol-related liver disease, well, the cure for that is abstinence from alcohol. That fat that's in the liver can, again, be removed from the liver. Your body clears it out um, as long as there's not advanced scarring, as long as you're not to the point of cirrhosis. So, indeed, alcohol liver, alcohol-related liver disease can be reversed. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease also can be reversed. So, again, both of those things cause fat, so both of them can have the fat go away. Um, With alcohol, you have to stop the cause of the fat, which is alcohol, and with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you have to stop the cause of the fat, which is weight loss. Um, So the goal is to lose 7 to 10% of body weight to see that fat start coming out of the liver. And, of course, controlling diabetes and high cholesterol because those are really important causes of fatty liver disease as well. So working with your primary care doctor, your endocrinologist, nutritionist to see if we can uh, improve that and reverse it before it becomes too late. Um, Hepatitis B. Because hepatitis B is a DNA virus as compared to hepatitis C, which is an RNA virus, we have a harder time so far curing it because the hepatitis um, 
B DNA gets into our DNA. As humans, we have DNA. Uh, and so it can get harder to get rid of the reservoir of hepatitis B. So we don't have a cure yet, but they're working on it. And I am very um, hopeful that we will have that soon. Um, but we can use medications in the meantime to suppress the virus. And by suppressing the virus, you suppress the inflammation. You can reverse the scarring. So, again, to get screened for hepatitis B and then be seen by a liver doctor who can help you understand whether if you need treatment is really important because we want to be able to prevent people from getting to those advanced stages of liver disease. I didn't talk about other causes of liver disease, but autoimmune hepatitis and primary biliary cholangitis are two types of liver disease where we have specific therapies, so I wanted to put them out here. For autoimmune hepatitis, that's where your own immune system reacts against your own liver cells, causing inflammation and potential injury and scarring, and we use things like steroids and immunosuppressive medications for that. And we also, uh, for biliary, primary biliary cholangitis, which is when your immune system attacks the teeniest, tiniest little bile ducts, the branches that actually connect to the leaves of the tree, uh, there's a medication called ursodiol, which, again, can cause um, reversal and prevention of scarring. Uh, we here at CPMC have programs for all of these different liver diseases. Um, Dr. Holt, uh, who many of you may know, runs the fatty liver disease program, and Dr. Yamam runs the autoimmune uh, liver disease program. So for patients who are out there or are interested, you have experts here in San Francisco to, to um, learn and be cared for, and for the clinicians in the audience, I'm sure if you were interested, they would love to give talks as well about their passions. Um, so overall, I did want to say a word about liver transplant because CPMC is a liver transplant program. And again, we're talking here about the fact that not all patients with liver disease are going to be on a spectrum that results in scarring and advanced scarring and cirrhosis. So when you take the whole population of people who have liver disease, it's a very small number who actually require liver transplant. And last year, there were about 8,500 transplants in the United States for um, liver transplant. And it is a, a potential treatment for those patients, again, where their liver is failing and we need to have a different solution. The Allocation for transplant, as I mentioned, is based on this thing called the MELD score, and so the higher the MELD score, the higher one is on the list if they are placed on a list after evaluation. And there are two different types of liver transplant that are done in this country. Dr. Osorio, um, the chair of our department here at CPMC, uh, provided me with these slides. Uh, but what you can see is here's my lumpy, bumpy, cirrhotic liver. Um, and it is uh, at the time of transplant. There are different uh, surgical ways to remove this liver. Um, and, but ultimately, the idea is it is removed. Uh, the various connections are um, surgically closed off, and then a new liver is sewn in. This is called a cadaveric liver transplant, meaning someone has passed away and they have donated their organs or their family has donated their organs. This is by far the most common cause of liver transplant in this country. 95% of uh, liver transplants are done through a deceased donor, cadaveric liver transplant. We do these here at CPMC. There is also something called a living donor liver transplant. About 5% of liver transplants in the United States are done. And you can, again, some uh, very technical things are happening here, uh, but you can either take, in some situations, the left lobe or the right lobe, depending if it's a pediatric or adult donor. Uh, and then, um, for example, this would be remaining in the donor. This lobe would be coming out, the right lobe would be coming out to the recipient and then sewn in. And then you have to make a special kind of connection to the bile duct uh, because this person gets to keep their bile duct, the donor. So we've talked a lot today, but I just wanted to leave a few take-home points, which is prevention of liver disease is key. So if someone has a risk factor for hepatitis B, they should be screened and then followed up um, to determine whether or not they need ongoing um, treatment or just monitoring. Uh, screening for hepatitis C is now recommended for a single time for adults over the age of 18. Uh, these, uh, both of these diseases, as I mentioned with treatment, can be controlled and hepatitis C can be cured. 
We've discussed the importance of avoiding excessive consumption of alcohol and to remember that moderate alcohol intake is considered to be one drink uh, for a woman per day and two, up to two drinks for a man, but not every day, uh, and that there's a real uh, concern for the increased risk of binge drinking and incidence of binge drinking in this country. Uh, and if anyone is interested, uh, there was a seminar on COVID-19 and uh, liver alcohol-related liver disease through the ASLD recently. Uh, so that might be something if people really want to kind of dive into that, uh, you could watch. Um, ultimately, also maintaining ideal body weight through healthy diet and exercise is a way to prevent developing fatty liver disease. And then if one is to find out that they have fatty liver disease, to lose that 7 to 10% of body weight. Uh, and this is through, importantly, there's all kinds of diets, and I did not um, think that I would have time to go into that here. Uh, but again, also, if people are interested, the ASLD did put a whole webinar together on my patient has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, what do I tell them about a diet? Um, and I see that there's some nutritionists uh, in the audience today. So uh, I, we always recommend that patients see nutritionists about how to ideally lose weight and maintain the weight off. And if you have liver disease, Ask your doctor if you meet cr criteria for liver cancer screening. As the director of the liver cancer program, I have to just mention liver cancer here to say that screening is really important because we know that if someone is screened, they find their disease earlier in the stage of their disease, and then we have more treatment options available. Um, so that's really important. And then following and working with your doctor, not only about their treatment advice, but what I was mentioning in some of the slides before about how does this disease affect you in the context of your life, and how can you work together to ensure that you are leading the life that you want to lead uh, with a healthy liver, because that's what we are all aiming for um, as liver uh, providers. So I had to put this in as, as a liver cancer doctor. The people that should be screened for liver cancer are people with hepatitis B, re regardless of whether they have cirrhosis or not. And then other patients, if you have cirrhosis, you should be getting screened with an ultrasound and an alpha feeder protein every six months. So thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you joining today. Um, and I just wanted to put in some resources. The American Liver Foundation has many webinars, patient education pages, and also the Center for Disease Control has some other. I got some of these uh, graphics that I showed you. They have some information there as well. If you are interested uh, in seeing a liver doctor, the CPMC number is here. So thank you. Perfect. Okay. So some of these questions were submitted during the registration process, and here's one of them. Uh, will a liver transplant cure liver-related diabetes? So uh, I'm not, ooh, whoa, sorry. Uh, I'm not sure what, what might be uh, implied by liver-related diabetes. Um, in patients who have diabetes, it's actually due to insulin resistance. And so fatty liver disease is part of the process of insulin resistance. So liver transplant does not cure diabetes. Um, the only caveat to that is there are certain types of hepatitis C uh, where there was a question of whether there's increased risk of diabetes with that type of hepatitis C. And then when we treat the hepatitis C, the diabetes does get better. Uh, but overall, the diabetes indeed stays after transplant and can worsen uh, due to some of the medications we use. So we really recommend that people both whenever they have diabetes or fatty liver disease are really following strict control of their diabetic, um, doing strict diabetic control, uh, even pre-transplant, so it will be better after transplant. Um, next question. My alcohol drinking at home has picked up during the pandemic. Is there liver damage I need to be aware of? Well, not everyone um, who drinks will have liver damage, but the problem is we don't know who it is, and most people will have some type of irritation and inflammation. But stopping the drinking or decreasing the drinking can decrease that inflammation and irritation, again, because you've taken the insult out of the equation. The liver has the ability to clean up any potential damage. So, you know, we've, we've seen that during COVID, people's rates of alcohol have indeed increased. And so what I just wanted to remind people of today is that um, moderate drinking is really for a woman, one drink a day, and for a man, up to two drinks a day, and really no more than seven drinks for a woman in a week and no more than 14 for a man. Uh, so if you find that you're in, in those ranges, and it's, it's really recommended to um, cut down. And what I recommend is that people 
take days of the week if they're daily drinking and say, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink two days out of the week. And then they're like, I'm not going to drink five days out of the week. And then suddenly they don't have that same habit anymore. Usually drinking is around a habit. Um, so that's one way to, to think about it. But talking to your regular doctor and engaging in potential ideas around talking to a therapist or doing some other um, behavior modifications can really help with this uh, so that you won't have problems with liver disease in the future. Thank you. Next question. Which hepatitis vaccinations are recommended and are they protective of liver cancer risk? So... Hepatitis B vaccinations would theoretically be protected against uh, liver cancer risk if someone were to get infected with hepatitis B. So we have hepatitis B vaccination. Um, hepatitis B vaccinations uh, are given at birth uh, for all kids, and this has been since the 1990s. Uh, and then um, that, that's and then there's also a hepatitis A vaccine, which there are very specific groups that are recommended. Um, again, children have been getting this for a long time. So I would recommend asking your primary care doctor if you are in the groups of people who should be getting vaccine, getting hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, if you could please distinguish between scarring and cirrhosis again. Yes, that's a great question. So scarring is when there's been inflammation that actually causes injury. And what happens at the level of the liver is that the cells try to respond to that injury and make it go away, but they do it in the wrong way. And these cells, there's a specific type of cells in the liver called stellate cells, and they actually start to lay down scar uh, in the liver. So early scarring is stage one. But as the liver starts to get more and more scarring throughout the liver, it can go all the way to the point where the whole liver is scarred. And when that happens, that's called cirrhosis. So it's a spectrum of scarring. When you have early scarring and you remove the insult, that scarring can get better. Once you get to the point of advanced scarring or cirrhosis, it's much harder to get rid of that scarring when you remove the insult. Great. Um, next participant asked if you could define ascites. Yes. So ascites is fluid that is accumulating in the abdomen. And so if you could recall from the CT scan I showed, there was a liver and then there was fluid around it. And what happens is that the liver, when it gets scarred, there's increased resistance to blood flow through the liver. And the liver is in between the heart at the top and something called the portal vein at the bottom. And that blood is floating through the liver up to the heart and going around in a circuit. But if the liver starts to get scarred, what happens is as the blood is coming in, it gets backed up. It's slower to get through. So I like to describe it as if you're on I-80 and there's a traffic jam, all those cars are backing up. So what do you do when you want to get home? You go on a detour. And so what happens in the liver when you have scarring like that is the detours develop, and that's ultimately something called portal hypertension and portosystemic collaterals. And ascites happens because when there's that backup, the fluid backs up and then it leaks out into the belly. Um, and so that's what ascites is, and there are different treatments for it. Thank you. Um, next question. My doctor says that excessive uh, work or damage on the liver can influence mood, such as anger. Um, could you elaborate on that? I'm not sure that that is a direct correlation. Um, I would answer this in that I think that Stress can affect all kinds of things, um, mood and health and other things, but I don't know that it causes excessive damage, particularly to the liver, like, for example, scarring. I've not seen that to be the case, but I do agree that when your mood is off or you are feeling stressed, then that can just affect your overall health and your ability to deal with challenges in your health when they arise. Thank you for that. Um, Next participant asked if uh, there are recommendations for overweight patients trying to improve liver disease. Um, he or she has been exercising more and more, but has found it hard to lose weight. 
Yes, this is common for patients to tell me this, and I think there are a few things to say here. Number one, really important to see a nutritionist because uh, diet is fundamental to this whole process because it's calories in and calories out, calories burned. And so you're burning calories with exercise, but part of it too is trying to understand how best to optimize the calories that are coming in. And there are different tricks around that. Not only do you have to decrease the total amount of calories, but there are different ways to uh, use those calories throughout the day to convince your body to stay active in terms of metabolizing. So I would recommend um, nutritionists, and I also would just recommend don't lose hope. I'm so proud of you that you are working on this and exercising, and that's great, and continue to do so. Thank you for that. Um, supplements or foods to promote liver health? So there aren't any specific supplements to promote liver health, and I know that there are a lot um, that we see uh, on online, um, but from specific studies, uh, those are really hard to, to study, but there are not specific recommendations that liver doctors give regarding supplements. And in fact, we get a bit concerned regarding supplements because many supplements, depending on where they come from or how they are made, supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So we, in fact, see patients who are on different types of supplements or herbs come in with something called acute liver injury. Uh, so um, I would just be mindful to talk to your regular doctor about what you're taking to ensure that it would be safe. Uh, and then overall, foods to promote liver health. The idea is, again, a well-balanced, healthy diet, uh, minimizing sugars, carbohydrates, and alcohol. Um, next question. Can a person have the abnormal blood vessel and not have liver disease? Yes, that uh, can indeed, and it just all depends on what what blood vessel we're talking about. Um, the liver has many different blood vessels at various levels, and so uh, some patients could have an abnormal blood vessel, but their their liver has accommodated over time. Other people, that's not the case. And so what I would recommend is if this is something that you're wondering about, uh, if you've been told by someone that you have an abnormal blood vessel in some way, just to really follow up with your doctor, because I don't think I can give a, a specific answer to that question. That would be truly um, the right answer. Thank you, Dr. Guy. Um, there, is an, um, there are two more questions, so we're moving at a really efficient pace here. Um, how much weight loss is required to reverse fatty liver? So 10 to 7, I'm sorry, 7 to 10 percent of your body weight is required. So for example, if someone weighs 250 pounds, the recommendation is to lose 25 pounds in six months. And we see that indeed the fat can come out of liver. Some people, they need to lose more than that depending on their height and their body mass index. But ultimately, starting with 7 to 10 percent of your body weight is a good target. Thank you. Uh, last question. Does exercise improve or heal liver disease outside of weight loss? So, yes. The answer is yes. Um, and that's in part because with exercise, you Im improve your lean uh, muscle mass, and that actually helps with the insulin resistance. And so, indeed, if you are, they call it, if you're fit but might still be overweight, that is a good first step. Obviously, we also need to improve weight loss overall to really get the fat out of the liver, but even just exercise um, is a good start. Um, I see there's another question that came in, Dr. Guy. Um, can taking calcium every day for several years uh, be bad for the liver? No. Thanks. I was very efficient. <laughs> Are there any checks, such as feeling around the abdomen for tenderness, that we can do at home? So I, for people who don't have liver disease or have early liver disease, the answer is no. Um, and in fact, that's why it's good just to be checking in with your doctor, because it's not just the physical exam in that instance. It's how you're feeling, what the clinical history is, what the lab tests are. Um, for people who know that they have cirrhosis and who have been talking to their liver doctor about whether or not they're at risk for developing ascites, as an example, then those patients, it's not, they may indeed notice if they're having swelling over their abdomen or their ankles, um, but it's not something that we're, um, 
we're telling people to pay attention, but only in that situation. So if you don't have any liver disease or if you have early liver disease, I, would, I don't think you need to be doing that. Thank you so much. So I will be sending out a post email that includes information about um, the feedback form, uh, appointments with Community Health Resource Center. Dr. Guy mentioned several times that um, working with a nutritionist is really helpful for losing weight, but also in the long run for liver, um, liver health management. I really enjoyed this lecture because um, I, I found that you really brought your years of experience into this accessible presentation that um, not just providers or people who work in healthcare would appreciate. Thank you for making it accessible again. You're welcome, and thank you for all your work. We're really grateful to have you guys partnering with us at CPMC. Thank you for joining us today.